for joining this workshop. At this time, I'd like to introduce Shayla Rodriguez, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thank good you, Erin. Shayla. Have a good, good workshop. Afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so glad. Uh, my name is Shayla Rodriguez, and I'm one of the presenters today. Um, I'm so glad to see everyone um, here, not only just from the Northeast region, but we have folks from all over the U.S. Just so glad to see everyone here uh, from a diverse group of uh, just different professional backgrounds. So to start us along, um, we just want to welcome you to the webinar on how to facilitate the Logic Models Workshop for Program Design and Evaluation. And as uh, Aaron stated at the beginning, uh, myself and my colleague, Dr. Karen Shackman, is will be facilitating uh, today's webinar. Um, so welcome, and um, we're looking forward to a good uh, hour or so that we'll have with you. So here we, uh, we'll start with uh, just going over some of the goals for today. So I want to state uh, first that uh, this webinar is an introduction to the toolkit, uh, which is uh, a training on logic models. Um, we're, we're not going to go over the full training today, but we're going to, um, our goal is to help you understand the resources that are contained in the toolkit. Um, we're not going to go over each and every section um, of the workshop, but we are going to highlight the main points and ways that you can use the activities throughout the workshop. Also, the toolkit contains the PowerPoint uh, slide deck um, that's going to have all of the slides that you'll need in order to deliver this workshop, which are also customizable. Um, so the, the, this workshop assumes that you have some familiarity with logic models and that you are interested in facilitating a workshop or session for your district or agency. Um, and we do have some um, archive sessions of our logic model workshops that we've done in the past. And um, you can access that um, in the RELNI website. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure to post that link in the chat pod. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's, we recommend that it's beneficial for you to just listen to those webinars. So that way, you can get an idea of how we have facilitated um, these webinars. Um, and um, basically, what we want to do is just you know, kind of give you some support on leading the sessions on logic modeling. So there's an assumption um, on familiarity. So here is today's agenda um, and what we will be focusing on in the next hour or so. First, I'm going to um, introduce uh, the toolkit, and then I'm going to pause for a moment and have our uh, colleague, Sandra Espada, who is the facilitator of the Puerto Rico Alliance on Dropout Prevention. And she's going to take a little bit of time to talk about her alliance and how they became interested in this workshop. Um, you know, talk a little bit about their experience and, and, and taking the workshop and what happened after the workshop was completed. Um, then Karen and I will go uh, give you a, sort of an, a, you know, an overview of the toolkit, and we're going to practice some of the workshop content. Um, we're going to conclude um, by providing you with some facilitation strategies and ways that you can set up your participants up for success. Now, I would like to mention that we will pause in the middle of the webinar and at the end for questions. But if you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to enter them into the chat pod. Um, and we'll respond to them either right away or um, you know, we will wait until that part of the workshop to answer your questions. So please don't hesitate um, as we go along. Just if you have any questions, just enter them into the chat pod. Uh, and we will make sure um, to answer those for you. So we, before we move on, um, we want to have everyone just answer a question for us. We have a, just a very short poll here. If you can take a moment to think about how do you plan to use the Logic Model Workshop Toolkit in your own context. So you know, just think about like what brings you um, to this workshop and how will, will the Logic Model be useful in your own work. So we just kind of wanted to get some, uh, you know, some sort of sense of you know, why everyone is here, you know, why are you attending this workshop, and how are you going to use this this toolkit um, in your own context and in your own work? What are your plans? What are you hoping um, to learn today? So let's take a moment here and see what folks are doing. So oh, we have here that there are some folks here that are hopefully to develop ideas for proposals. 
again, logic models, and, and we'll uh, state this, that logic models are really great um, you know, for proposals, and we know that a lot of proposals are requiring um, logic models for a program um, design. Training for the school district, writing grants, program development. Wow, there's a lot of uh, good stuff here. So help we, uh, helping with your own practice here, Brenda, she, you know, she wants to share it with the colleagues and hopefully uh, use it in their own setting. When working with schools with districts and designing grant proposals, as well as project management and evaluation for program planning. Again, yeah, logic models um, are very useful for program planning and evaluation. So we have a lot of... Uh, a lot of people here who are going to really utilize this logic model toolkit. Um, and we hope that after today's session, you'll have um, a better idea and a better sense of how to facilitate these workshops. I'll take another moment here, and then um, we'll move on. Facilitate the logic model workshops. So you're in the right place, Todd and to expand the current knowledge and help faculty members develop grant proposals. Again, there's a lot in here about grant proposals and using the logic models for that. Great. This is great that um, everyone's here. There's lots of good stuff. All right, so let's move on. So uh, let me just introduce a little bit on the toolkit. So we, um, for, you know, we received a lot of interest um, from our Alliance members in learning about uh, logic models. And therefore, um, versions of this workshop were presented to three RELNI Research Alliances in 2013 in two different formats. Now, the Puerto Rico Research Alliance for Dropout Prevention um, participated in a three-hour face-to-face workshop that focused on supporting their efforts to generate a common vision for dropout prevention work. Um, also, we, we presented this workshop to the Urban School Improvement Alliance and the Northeast Educator Effectiveness Research Alliance, which both participated in virtual webinars for a broad audience of practitioners that were really interested in just developing their skills um, and capacity to, to use and develop logic models. We have also delivered this uh, workshops in many different forms um, to other constituent groups outside of our research alliances as well. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of you know, how we sort of used this toolkit and how this toolkit came about. Um, really came from the interest um, from, from our Alliance members just wanting to learn more about developing logic models and how they can use that for program evaluation. So now I am going to turn it over to Sandra Aspada, um, who is a facilitator of the Puerto Rico Alliance on Dropout Prevention. And she's going to talk about the Alliance and their experience with the workshop. Sandra? Hi, good afternoon to all, and thank you for the invite to um, participate in this uh, webinar and share um, briefly what, how the Puerto Rico Research Alliance and Dropout Prevention um, utilize the, uh, the logic model toolkit that is presented today. Um, I am excited to see a, a good group today, so I hope we can provide good information for for you to use. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, the Puerto Rico um, Research Alliance was uh, created in 2012. This is um, a, a project that the re the Regional Educational Laboratory for the Northeast and Islands is facilitating, and, and I have the uh, the the honor to. Uh, be working with this group since the beginning. Uh, and the goals that this research alliance has established is to support the Department of Education in Puerto Rico to prevent and reduce the numbers of students that are dropping out, which is one of the uh, uh, high, highest priorities for the department locally. Uh, and we also identified uh, as a goal for the alliance um, the support of the uh, department's uh, efforts to establish an early warning system that can um, assist them in identifying and um, put together uh, interventions to uh, to prevent that kids drop out from their uh, from their schools. So, with that in mind, the the membership of the alliance was designed to be 
uh, you sh of course, the Department of Education. We have the uh, the pleasure of having there the uh, key leadership of the department participating. And we also have the Puerto Rico Institute of Statistics. The executive director is on board with us since the beginning with this. And the college board um, office in Puerto, of Puerto Rico and Latin America, which is um, housed here in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And, and they have been uh, a partner since the beginning as well. There are other um, members that are from other organizations that are interested in the topic, uh, but these three organizations are the key, uh, the key ones. And uh, with them, uh, we came to the uh, realization that although all these organizations were in some way related to um, efforts to prevent dropouts at schools, uh, there was a need to have um, a coherent um, uh, plan. Uh, for them to work uh, together uh, and, and use the resources more effectively. Um, so we decided when the alliance was created to um, bring to them a group of uh, a series of workshops to support the, um, the development of the work plans of the alliance and, and to be able to implement uh, the goals that they have established for, for the alliance. And the logic model workshop was um, one of the first activities that this alliance um, uh, had. Uh, we conducted this with the support of um, uh, Sheila Rodriguez and Karen Shackman and Jenny Scala. Uh, we conducted this session in, in the summer of 2013. And as the, as the session, uh, we, um, we spent time uh, learning about the roles of the individuals. This is, um, you know, something that you usually do when you gather people that uh, come from different backgrounds. Uh, and that was very important at that time uh, because we were trying to create a group to, to last, uh, to continue working throughout several years on this, on this activity. So creating that uh, cohesion among the group was important. We, we spent some time doing that, and then um, uh, the workshop facilitators walked them through the elements of uh, what is a logic model, uh, for what purposes you can use them. Um, and as you can imagine, the folks in the, in the session came with different levels of knowledge about this, so they had to work us through uh, through that and uh, <clears throat> and using um, examples that were more directly related to dropout prevention, they um, they guided the group to have some discussions uh, and generate ideas on how to put together our own logic uh, log our own logic model. Uh, the workshop um, helped us to identify that there was uh, several needs that needed to be addressed. And, um, and with that, the, uh, the Puerto Rico Research Alliance sort of um, established uh, work plans for the, for the coming years. Um, uh, as outcomes of the discussions in this session, we realized that we needed a closer communication and collaboration between the, uh, the key stakeholders. Um, they um, they were, um, and this might be usual, usual in your own settings, they were having um, different definitions of what a dropout student is. And so issues like that were needed to, to be discussed um, uh, with, with, uh, with more uh, communication, more intense communication. So uh, they also, uh, identified that they uh, that some studies were needed to understand better the uh, the phenomenon of of the uh, of the dropouts and to understand better the statistics that were the data that was available about dropouts and uh, and that the uh, activities that the Department of Education uh, and other organizations in the island outside of the department were conducting to support the students and, and provide interventions uh, were needed to to were needed to be known better 
um, because there was an understanding that some duplication of efforts uh, was occurring. Uh, with that, what happened was that the alliance then uh, started thinking about specific projects that we can uh, do to support um, more efficiently the, uh, the Department of Education. And uh, uh, several research studies were proposed and, um, and have been in the process of uh, being completed. Um, there was a study on um, what were the characteristics of the schools, the public schools in Puerto Rico, and their students' graduation rates um, to, to have a better idea of the trends with regard to why the kids are dropping out or the key elements to identify them. We also started a study that is also about to be completed this year on which were the schools that um, were beating the odds. You know, regardless of their uh, conditions, they were having good results. And um, what, what was happening there that can be replicated by other schools in the system, um, we started to um, identify the data that was available and, and that it still needed to be um, uh, collected. To, for the department to be able to have uh, an early warning system indicator. Uh, um, and then we also used the, uh, another series of workshops on P16 collaboration to, to create that uh, cohesion among the, the sectors through the system um, from uh, pre-K, actually, is what the department is expecting to have. Uh, Pre-K through the 16 schooling year, um, uh, all these stakeholders that are involved in that to to continue thinking on the uh, on the phenomenon of dropout and how to prevent it as a as um, as a continue. This has to be something embedded within the system. Uh, so, with that, I think that. Uh, I, I have provided you very briefly some ideas of how we use the toolkit. I am going to remain in the webinar. Um, and if you have questions about uh, the Puerto Rico Alliance and how we experienced this toolkit um, in the past, I will be happy to answer your questions uh, in the chat. And I think that Karen Shackman is uh, going to continue with the session today. Thank you all for uh, listening to me. Thank you, Sandra. Um, yeah, so I am going to jump right in. I will say that it was a great pleasure to deliver the workshop in Puerto Rico a few years ago. Um, and when we did it, as Sandra said, we did it as a sort of an all-day face-to-face event. And as we dig into the facilitator workshop and um, or the workbook and the workshop in general, we will point out some of the ways that we've used um, activities in a virtual context as well as when we've done this kind of work in a face-to-face -face context. And the workbook will indicate that as well. So for those of you who have downloaded the toolkit, you'll see that it is a fairly large document that includes both a facilitator and a participant workbook embedded within the same um, large document. Um, and in addition, there are PowerPoint slides that can be downloaded separately from the toolkit on the RELNI website. And the toolkit, as I said, is organized with a facilitator workbook, then followed by the participant workbook. Um, and both can be downloaded and then separated out for print. So you as the facilitator can have a version that has several kind of additional hints and suggestions to you, um, but that mirrors what is in the participant workbook as well. And just a note, if you have not yet downloaded the Logic Model Toolkit, as we work through the workshop, it would be useful for you to be able to look through what we're talking about. So please go ahead and, and do that now. You'll see the pod download the Logic Model Toolkit right on your screen. And you can do that. So the toolkit is designed to be given in two sessions, though it's not required to be given that way. As we've laid it out in the workshop, it has two sessions. The first focuses on logic models and is two hours long. It goes through the elements of the logic model and how you would develop a logic model, as well as some of the sort of rationale or larger thinking about what logic models are and how they might be useful. Session two picks up where session one leaves off and really focuses on how one employs logic models for program and policy evaluation and gets into some basics about 
uh, evaluation of a program and policy. Again, it's not a deep dive into the different types of evaluation, but it is kind of an overview of thinking about evaluation and how you use a logic model to help drive your evaluation design. Uh, there are activities uh, in both sessions. These, this workshop is designed to be very, very interactive, either if you're working in a, in a virtual or in a face-to-face -face um, face -face context. Um, the facilitator guide also indicates ways that you can extend these activities. Uh, we focus a lot on some of the in-person ways to extend the activities, thinking about, for example, several of you said that you're interested in working with a particular group. Um, either in writing grants or in um, school design. And if you're working with a particular group, we've given some indication of ways that you might extend these activities to focus on a particular content area, like Sandra talked about the alliance focusing on dropout prevention. But the workshop can also be delivered for a more agnostic group that does not um, represent a particular focus area. Uh, and again, all of those extensions can be found in the workbook with this light bulb indicating that they're extensions from the basic overview of the workshop. I just want to take a moment to talk about the goals of each session um, and a little more detail about them. In session one, we introduced the logic model as an effective tool, not just for evaluation, but for program design and implementation as well. We practice the elements of the logic model. And in the logic model version that we use, there are eight elements, such as uh, the problem statement or strategies and activities or different outcomes. Um, that is the logic model template that we are using. We know some of you who are familiar with logic models. The language may be slightly different from other versions of logic models that you've seen, but um, the general ideas hold true kind of across logic models. But we'll introduce you to a particular template of logic model. And then the final goal is to provide guidance in the appropriate steps that one might use to build a logic model. And just a word there to think about with, as you're working with your colleagues on logic models, to really think about logic model development as a process and not necessarily just about developing the product. And we try to reiterate that throughout the workshop, that it's really important to think about building logic models as a way to bring people together, to develop a common vision of the work, and to kind of iron out um, what assumptions you have, what language you might be using, uh, and get clear about the theory driving your work. So while logic models are certainly a very useful tool and required in a lot of grant applications, as Shayla will say, they're really designed to be living, breathing documents that are used, um, that in the process of developing them, there's a lot of good learning and work that's done. And then these logic models should be used as a tool throughout program implementation and evaluation. As I said, session two picks up where session one left off using logic models to develop evaluation questions and developing indicators of success. And we also provide guidance in how to determine the appropriate evaluation for a specific program or policy. And those are the goals of both the sessions. As I'd mentioned, there are interactive activities throughout the sessions. The first is actually a pre-activity that you'd find on page six of the workbook that gets people thinking about a specific program or policy that they would like um, to have in their mind as they work through the workshop. All of these activities are designed to be engaging and customizable to the particular group you're working with. Uh, we also focus on case examples throughout the workshop, and I'll talk about that briefly in the next slide. Uh, and again, as I said, embedded in the workbook are these light bulbs that, that provide ways to extend the activities um, either in virtual or face-to-face -face context. A little bit about the case examples. Um, the toolkit provides five potential case examples that you can use. There are infinitely more that might be usable. But the five that we provide brief summaries of are a college readiness program, a blended learning, an educator evaluation implementation in a district context case, a professional development for science teachers case, and a universal pre pre-kindergarten policy, uh, statewide policy implementation case. So these are the five cases that we provide as samples that you may use. And then throughout the toolkit, we uh, focus on two specific cases. Those are the college readiness and the blended learning cases. The idea of the cases is really to help participants understand how to develop a logic model from beginning to end. And instead of having participants 
sort of come up with their own examples and have to work with those. It can be easier to have a case example that participants can follow throughout the workshop and then have a common language for them to use as they're kind of working through the different elements of the, of the logic model. Uh, we would suggest that you have your participants take a few minutes at the beginning of the workshop to read one of these cases, either one of the ones that we've presented, or you can come up with a different case that might be more relevant to your group. Uh, and then ask them to think about the goals of the program or policy and what they would like to know more about the program or policy. And then have a brief discussion to kind of orient everybody to what the case is about and give them a chance to kind of think about what the case is saying. And again, that sort of builds the common language that, will, that they will use throughout the workshop to understand these different elements. And you will find, again, you'll find the cases in, someone has asked about where these additional case examples are. Everything is in the toolkit. So we have, again, we've given five potential case examples, and then we've carried two of them throughout the toolkit. But um, they're easily customizable. You'll see the ways you can change it if you want to use a different a case or you want to use one of our cases that isn't the college ready or the blended learning one throughout the workshop. So that's a little bit orienting you to kind of what's there. And then I'm going to now turn it over to Shayla to take you into uh, what happens in session one. Thank you, Karen. So I will be going over um, what's going to happen, uh, what happens during session one. And in session one, we do have eight activities. Um, so the, the content of session one is, is basically on the basis of, of logic modeling, um, as Karen stated, which includes um, defining you know, what a logic model is, um, and then having the participants going through the different elements of the logic models, um, and then providing some next steps as to what they can do once um, they've gone through this first session of the workshop. So th throughout the session, we do provide uh, various examples. Um, that will help your audience or your participants have a better understanding of what logic models are, how to develop one, and their purpose. Uh, we do suggest that um, the presenter, if that's going to be you or someone else um, in your organization, um, to be familiar with uh, logic models and have some familiarity with the content that the particip participants might apply uh, to the skills presented in the workshop. And we found this very helpful to just, you know, just getting to know your audience and sort of what are uh, what are sort of the issues, the problems that they're facing, and, and how will that a logic model help in that process? So here, um, in going through the workshop, I just want to go over some sort of underlying ideas to convey um, throughout the workshop as you are facilitating this. Um, it is important to continuously revisit some um, important ideas, such as uh, presenting you know, the logic model as a tool for program design. Um, an evaluation and not as an actual evaluation plan. Um, also highlighting that developing a logic model um, is, is really best when utilizing a systematic process. And, and it's important to really reiterate the importance of involving uh, key stakeholders in the process, especially when you're generating the different elements of the model. Um, so, and, and also very important is logic models should be seen as living documents and should not just be left on the shelf and then forgotten about. And you want to consider you know, how will you build the logic model into program monitoring? Um, will, will the logic model be revisited yearly? Um, will you build an implementation plan around that model? Um, or will you train all staff on the actual model? Um, it's important to think about what's going to happen after the logic model is developed. So these are just some key ideas that you should convey um, to your audience as you facilitate uh, the workshop. So when we uh, begin session one, uh, the, the workshop uh, starts off by having a, a participants you know, review the case, as, as Karen stated, um, and then we do an activity based on the case that's related to the case. And then once you go over the case um, and complete the first activity, then you want to start off the workshop by first finding what a logic model is. And in the workbook on, on page 11 of the facilitator guide, um, we use the metaphor uh, of a map in which logic models should clarify um, where you are going and how they provide sort of markers along the way um, or sort of a, a pathway of getting to the outcomes desired. So these are just some questions um, that you would want to pose to get your audience thinking about the idea of a, of a logic model and their values. So where are you going? How will you get there? and what will tell you that you have arrived. So let's pause here 
Um, and we want to hear from you about some of the purposes of a logic model. Um, so we want you to just enter in the chat pod. We just want to know how uh, you plan on using a logic model, but just thinking about a logic model um, for your own, let's say, organization or your own program. Um, how would you use that logic model? Remember that logic models are a tool that can guide the work that you are doing or want to accomplish. Now, this could be for program planning. It could be for program implementation. Um, so we just kind of want to get your ideas on how you can utilize a, a logic model. So we want you to, as Karen stated here, just be specific. Um, so do you have a logic model that you want to develop for a specific purpose? Um, so here we have folks just saying you know, they want to analyze progress and implementation. Uh, they want to use it as a framework to design grant goals and outcomes. Again, program evaluation is a big one. Uh, oh, Kendra here said that she wants to help, uh, help state initiatives plan their implementations, outcomes, and evaluations. Um, and how else would you use a logic model? So here we have Brenda, developer program evaluation design. Uh, here, the person who is from Rhode Island for the development of their state system, systemic improvement plan for IDEA. Wow. For program planning or for blended learning, Laura, and we have actually a blended learning case, so, and, and I think uh, one of our webinars that are um, actually recorded is on the blended learning case. Let's take another moment here, and then we'll move on. Mary Ann says the framework for collaborating and planning for Im implementation of title programs. Yes, so these are really great ways um, that you can use um, logic models. It's great that we're getting a lot of participation here. Todd here says that uh, he uses them to summarize key program and or service elements. So sort of explaining the rationale behind the activities, clarifying those outcomes, and as a communication tool. Great. All right, so let's move on and continue on uh, to talk. So hopefully this gets you thinking about, you know, what's the purpose of, of the logic models. and so once you've, you've gone through sort of the case and, and, and defined what logic models are, um, you know, we want to go over sort of the different elements of, of the logic model. But just to note, for the purposes of this webinar, we're just going to be providing sort of a brief overview of the key sections, knowing um, that the workshop will definitely be longer than we are presenting here. So here, before we go over the elements of the logic model, you want to discuss and define sort of the general concept that drives the logic model, um, that there are inputs, outputs, and outcomes um, that make up um, the logic of the model. So again, as I stated before, the logic model is a graphic representation of the relationship among these various elements. And in order to help participants really understand the difference between inputs, outputs, and outcomes, um, and because sometimes it can, it can be a little bit confusing, we like to use actually a simple example of a headache. And as you can see on page 13 of the facilitator guide, uh, it really gives you a step-by-step -step explanation of the headache example that you can, you can choose to use in order to explain these terms. But I'm actually, I, I'm gonna illustrate it for you so that way you can get an idea of like, this is why we're, we use this, this example. So imagine that you have a headache and you want it to go away. So what would be some inputs? And we just want to, you know, if you want to just input on the chat pod, what do you think would be some inputs? And think about inputs as, you know, here we have is what is invested. Um, so what would you want to invest in order to take care of this headache? So for example here, Karen stated that maybe some aspirin. Um, so that would be an input. Um, quiet time, Amelia here, some rest. Yes. Um, what would be some other inputs? Sleep. One other good one, water, um, and maybe a hot compress. And then we would get, then move on and say, so what would be some outputs? So what are you going to do with those inputs? So we said that some of the inputs are taking aspirin, uh, having quiet time, rest, sleep. What are you going to do with those inputs? What would be some of those outputs? Maybe. Uh, so if you want to just enter in the chat, like what do you think would be some good outputs as you're dealing with this headache? Maybe, you know, I know that one of you said some quiet time. Maybe you need to sit quietly for five, ten minutes. Um, Amelia here said take a nap. 
Um, you know, Karen said, if I have aspirin, then I would definitely take it. Um, maybe drinking some water. Yeah, that's great. Taking the aspirin and actually putting that hot compress on. You have the hot compress, now you put it on. And then we move on to say, so what is the outcome? So what are you hoping the results would be? Um, and maybe, you know, you have this headache, so what do you want the result to be? What would be the outcome? Let's see if anybody, um, that the headache is gone. That's an obvious one. Um, if you're taking a nap and getting more sleep, maybe that you are more relaxed. You know, as you're, you're uh, rested, you've taken your aspirin, your headache goes away, now you can probably get back to work um, and go about your day and the headache goes away. So this kind of gives you, an, this gives you an idea of an example that, I, you know, that we have found to be very successful in helping the audience really understand these different elements um, between what, what's the difference between an input, an output, and an outcome. So let's move on. So after going over the inputs, outputs, and outcomes, we actually provide an example from one of the cases to help participants understand the difference between inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and the relationships among the three elements. Again, um, as you look at this table, you can customize this table and use another case from the workbook or one that you have created. So the example here, based on a blended learning program or a program that employs brick and mortar classrooms and virtual learn learning, is used to illustrate how participants um, might think about the inputs for such a program. So let's see, for example, like, you know, we're looking at the inputs here, uh, what technology infrastructure they have, and in general, um, what resources they have to contribute to that program. Then in looking at the outputs column here, or what they expect to do with those resources, such as completing, you know, an infrastructure audit or offering, you know, um, a six days of summer uh, for the teacher's uh, professional development. And then finally, looking at what are the outcomes, so what can they expect, such, um, expect from all of this, such as you know, teachers reporting maybe um, the use of diverse instructional strategies and increase um, in student engagement and seeing those increased scores on district-wide assessments. So the idea here is to really show participants a completed table and then follow with an activity where participants can actually create some inputs, outputs, and outcomes based on one of the other cases or um, using their own context. So it's important to note that in the workbook on page 15, the light bulb suggests an extension uh, for a virtual workshop with a functionality that allows participants to choose like the inputs, outputs, or outcomes, and then the facilitator um, may manipulate them on the screen. And, and this could also, if you're doing this in a face-to-face -face context, um, this could also be completed with like, you know, having strips of paper um, with all of the inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and then having participants actually organize them in the right columns. Um, so this is just some suggestions as to how you can sort of um, facilitate this activity, this part of the work, and this part of the workshop. So then we move on to talk about actually the meat of the workshop um, and talk about actually the different elements of a logic model. So here you would then present on each of the elements, um, each that comes with examples and activities that, uh, that go along with these elements. And you'll find all of these examples and activities in the actual toolkit. Now on the PowerPoint slide deck, we also have a slide with a simple picture of a logic model, which is also here on the screen. And, and this helps really participants in looking at a very basic model and the logical progression of the placement of the different elements within the model itself. So the first thing that we would do is dig in and defining um, what a problem statement is, which you will find on page 16 of the facilitator workbook. Um, and, and the problem statement, um, you, what you would do is define it and then have participants do an activity that goes along with this element. And then you would move along now um, to the second element, um, which is outcomes. Now, on page 19 of the toolkit, you'll notice that we have an activity on outcomes. Again, um, you know, you would define what outcomes are. You know, you talked about about inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and sort of had them um, go over what what the differences are in the relationships within the logic model. But here, when we we do the activity on outcomes, the idea is to support 
uh, participants to really think about their own context and apply the activities to their own um, context when they're ready to do so. Otherwise, again, here, you can use one of the cases. Um, in the example here, we actually use the College Ready case, um, and we ask participants to consider this chart and then systematically identify the target or who is affected by the outcome, what the desired change is, and by when. So in this example, as you see on the screen, the focus is on high school seniors in, in three urban high schools, and the desired change is to increase applications to post-secondary institutions by a certain time. And here on the screen, of course, is by June 2014. Again, the light bulb section in, in the workbook, which is on, on page 20, um, will include some guidance about ways to approach this activity. But uh, um, it's important to note that participants should really try to complete the table in this format, because it's really a great tool for focusing people on measurable outcomes, which will be valuable for using the logic model to conduct evaluation. Now, before we move on um, on the logic and logic models, uh, you'll notice that we didn't go over all of the elements of the logic model. But if you follow the workbook um, and the PowerPoint slide deck for this workshop, you're going to have you you'll have the appropriate resources and materials to go over each element of the logic model, um, which you know would include the, the strategies and activities, resources, and assumptions. And once all of the elements of the logic model are presented with the appropriate activities, then we end um, by talking about the importance of the theory embedded in the model and if-then statements. Now, in this example, again, we use the blended learning case. And you see the overall logic that if the district invests in blended learning, then the hope is that instruction will be more personalized and students will be more engaged. And if they are more engaged, then student achievement will increase. Again, this is just a way of articulating the overall logic that drives a program of policy. And the toolkit will provide guidance on how to do this activity both virtually um, and in a face-to-face -face context, which is on, on page 27 of your toolkit. So once we, talked about, we talk about the logic and logic models, then uh, before we end session one of the workshop, we actually asked participants what their next steps may be now that they have gone through this workshop. Now, in a virtual format, we have uh, just used a chat pod where participants actually type in what their next steps will be, and then we comment um, as participants submit their responses. If you're doing this in a face-to-face -face environment, um, you can just ask for volunteers to state their next steps. We then end the workshop with some final thoughts and some important reminders on developing logic models. So now um, that we've sort of gone over the material for session one and giving you some suggestions, uh, we just want to kind of we want to pause here and take any questions um, that you may have um, before we move on uh, to talking about session two. So if you have any questions, uh, if you can please um, enter those in the chat pod. And Shayla, I'll give you a moment this is here. Karen here. Yes. I was just going to comment on some of the great questions that folks have raised and just sort of reiterate them to the larger group. And if there are additional questions, please feel free to include them in the chat. There are some excellent questions as, as we're moving along. Um, so one respondent uh, or one, one participant indicated that the inputs, outputs, outcomes part of the workshop may or may not be relevant for her group. And I encouraged her to think about who the audience is and how much they need that orienting to kind of the overall logic or theory of action driving a project or a program. Um, and that can be skipped over. And you can jump right into the eight elements if you think the, it's appropriate for the group, if the group has a certain level of sophistication about theory of action. It can be very useful to have them start off thinking about inputs, outputs, and outcomes more generally before you get into the elements. It can kind of orient them to the big picture before you dig into the elements. But it really depends on the group and their familiarity with um, theories of action or with logic models. Um, another question that came up was about in the, in the chart where you indicate kind of the step-by-step -step of your outcomes, whether or not you would need baseline data to kind of indicate the amount of increase that you would like to see. And actually, as we move into this next 
session, which is the part two where you move from building your logic model to using your logic model for evaluation, that's really where you would need to be thinking about what's some baseline data. Um, for example, you know, how many students are currently submitting applications to college and how do you want to see that increase. Uh, the logic model can be really a, a tool that more broadly states, states the goals or the theory driving the program, and you don't need to include in a logic model that there will be a certain percentage increase. It really depends on the logic model. We do have a little language in the toolkit about different types of logic models. Depending on the goal of your logic model, is it a logic model for program implementation or for evaluation, for example? Um, you might target kind of the level of specificity uh, based on the goals of the, the logic model, what you're trying to accomplish. So I hope that answers those questions in a little more detail and um, again would encourage people to keep putting these excellent questions into the chat. Thank you, Karen. And sure. so, um, yeah, if we don't have any more questions, then um, we can, uh, we'll move right along and really dig into session two, which Karen um, is going to go over. So, Karen? Thank you, Shayla. So, um, as you know, we divided this workshop into two parts because we thought it was really very important for folks to have a real understanding of logic models uh, before getting into the notion of program and policy evaluation and how to use logic models for program and policy evaluation. Um, but I want to say that we've done many versions of this workshop or these workshops, these two sessions. Um, and while they're designed as two separate sessions, we've combined pieces of the workshop for different groups. We focus on just the first workshop, just the logic modeling and not the evaluation part uh, for some groups. And we've combined pieces of it for groups that were more ready to get right into the evaluation. So as you work through the toolkit and you think about your group and your goals, feel free to um, take pieces that are most relevant. This is your tool for you to use as appropriate with the group that, that you want to deliver the workshop for. So a little bit about how it's designed, session two is designed. It really picks up where we left off with session one um, and starts with a brief review of what logic models are. Again, we have a pre-assignment to guide the work, and it, particularly if you have the benefit of being able to ha deliver the first workshop on logic models and then the second one um, that uses logic models for program and policy evaluation. If you're able to give some time in between and invite people to go back to, the, to their groups or go back and do some more work on building an actual logic model, then it's great for them to bring those draft logic models with them to session two and really start off with a critique of the logic models. And you'll find on page 35, I'll talk about this, but you'll find some guidance about how to critique. So that's the, the pre-assignment. If folks don't have the opportunity to uh, review, to develop their own logic model, it would be important for them to have some familiarity with the sample logic models that you'll find in Appendix C and D because those are used as examples throughout the second workshop. Again, we revisit the cases, the college ready and the blended learning case, but you could revisit whatever case you choose and use whatever sample logic model is most appropriate. Um, and then fairly quickly, we dig into the rest of the workshop that gets into a brief introduction to what evaluation is and different kinds of evaluation, um, and then moves from using the logic model to generate evaluation questions to using the logic model to generate indicators and provide some guidance about how to build an evaluation design and, and offer some tools related to that, and then closes the session. So there's a lot that happens in session two. Again, it begins with this review of logic models and what they are. And as I said, participants are encouraged to come with a draft logic model if there's time between sessions or to become familiar with a sample logic model. Now again, we've provided two sample logic models uh, aligned to the cases, but we would encourage you as a facilitator to come with a sample logic model that you'll use as a case throughout session two. So depending on whether or not you want to use the examples we used or modify them for your audience. Um, but they'll be drawn on throughout the workshop. Uh, and then, as I said, page 35 includes a set of questions to guide a critique of logic models. And those are questions such as, what elements of logic model were the hardest to develop? What assumptions did you uncover? What's the time frame for your outcomes? And these set of questions can really be used um, as an opportunity to dig into a critique of the logic models and have, for example, if you have a group of people bringing different logic models, it's a wonderful opportunity for them to review other logic models, 
have folks critique their work and get some great ideas. Um, and on page 36 of the toolkit, we offer some suggestions for how to, how to extend this activity and have real time for that um, kind of critical friend type of work related to the logic models that people bring to the workshop. Session two, as I said, then gets into an introduction of evaluation. So after you've spent some time reviewing the logic models that people have brought, uh, if you are in the position to be able to do that, uh, you transition then to a focus on evaluation and how the logic model may be used to guide the development of an evaluation plan. So the first task is to dis discuss some basics about evaluation. And as I said, there are some. This is a very sort of an evaluation 101. It's quite, it's quite general. Um, but as we develop this workshop initially for folks who are not researchers and evaluators, but for example, for policy or program people who need to have a general understanding of evaluation, this can be a very helpful kind of primer on evaluation. Um, and the first activity asks people to consider their logic models or the absence of a logic or in the absence of a logic model, some program or policy that they're working on and to brainstorm ways they might know they've been successful. So we thought we could take just a moment here, um, we've been talking for a while, and just have you think about the programs or policies that you're thinking about doing this work with, and just type in some ideas about what you think uh, might be an indicator that your program or policy is successful. How might you know? And this is something that we ask participants to do as well, um, is to think about, in a general way, how might they know they've been successful. It kind of primes the pump for them to get into the idea of generating indicators. Um, again, you'll see that parallels a little bit what we did with the inputs, outputs, outcomes, starting kind of big picture general, um, and then getting into the specifics of building these, uh, these indicators of success. So there's one. Peggy has said the number of people participating, um, whether or not student attendance increases. Again, what are some indicators? How would you know in a general way that your program or policy is having the results that you would like to see. So I'm just going to pause and let people put some of those thoughts in. Um, and again, at this point, you wouldn't need to know specific numbers. You're just asking people to think in a general way. How do you know that the work that you're doing is making the kind of difference that you want it to make? Um, the program makes data-based course corrections based on data. So something if you have a program where you're really interested in uh, people's use of data, so then you can see course corrections based on that data. And again, you don't need to know at this point exactly how you're going to measure that. You just want people to be generating. This is very generative. You want people to be generating their ideas. So we have high quality student-centered learning as a norm within the majority of classroom among participating school districts. So student-centered learning is your goal. We don't yet know how you're going to measure that, but we know that that's a goal. Um, so some folks are putting in here kind of specific tools, and some folks are putting in here kind of general goals. But again, it's, the idea here is to get people thinking about how they might know um, that the program or policy has been successful. So I think this is great. And again, when you're asking your participants to think about it, there's no wrong answer here. You just want them thinking in a broad way about these ideas. And then quite soon, you'll move into more specifics. So I think with that, we can move back into um, the workshop. and. Um, and talk a little bit about what comes next. So um, the workshop then provides, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. We've skipped over a little bit of what's in the workshop, which you'll find in your toolkit. But we provide, as I said, an overview of the types of evaluations with a focus on both formative and summative types of evaluations and some guidance regarding how to generate appropriate evaluation questions, whether those are formative or summative evaluation questions. And, we found that to be a very useful thing to have people kind of step back and spend a little time thinking about. And then we get into what um, we think is a really helpful tool, uh, which is often forgot when designing an evaluation, and that's to think about who the audience is for whom the evaluation is being designed. And we encourage participants, just as we encouraged participants in part two, to really thinking about building the logic model as a collective effort. Um, we also encourage people to consider the development of evaluation as something that engages various stakeholders and considers different audiences. So this chart here really shows you the way that we're encouraging, an activity that we encourage people to do, which is to um, 
think about who the different potential audiences might be for the evaluation that they'd like to have, what kinds of questions those audiences might have, and how they might use the results of those questions. So for example, program staff might want to know if they're reaching their target population. And then they might use that to make changes to how they operate their program. Whereas funders want to know whether or not the program in a general way is meeting its goals, and whether or not the program is worth the cost that they've invested. And so therefore, they might have, that might indicate different types of evaluation. And they might use the results of that evaluation to make decisions about whether or not they'll continue funding the project, um, to consider ways to increase the accountability of the program. So again, um, taking the time to stop and think about who the audience is and what kinds of questions they have is something we've found people enjoy doing. It really allows them to take a step back. Now, um, when we are done with that part of the workshop, we then move into a fairly lengthy portion focused on generating indicators of success using the logic model as a starting place. So this brief activity really helps participants to relate to the idea of indicators. So just like we asked you with a headache um, to, to kind of step back from your particular program and policy and think in a broad way, we do a similar thing here in, in the second workshop. So in a virtual session, we would ask people, just like we're going to ask you now, to indicate your ideas in the chat box. And we ask you the question, how do we know if a child has a flu? So again, we want you to Jot your notes in here, again, about what would be the indicators. How would you know that a child has a flu? Um, and we see the child doesn't look happy, so something about their affect, feel their head for a fever, they have body aches, not eating, lethargy, fever, vomiting, fever, rising temperature, flushed skin, lethargy again, sore throat, sweating. So all of these would be indicators. This would be ways that we know that a child has the flu. And what do these all have in common? Well, they're evidence that can be seen, heard, or felt, and they are specific and measurable. So that, to us, helps folks. Again, this is kind of an anchor for getting into our discussion of indicators um, and helps folks think about specifically how indicators are um, evidence that can be seen, heard, and felt, and that are specific and measurable. So with that, we then move people back again into after breather to have people think in a broad way, we move back into specifically think about, thinking about our programs and policies and how we'll know the program is successful. And we'll need some understanding of what success is or what our indicators of success would be. And we use the logic model to help generate that, which will show you how that works over the next several slides. So here you'll see we've taken, um, again, the idea of inputs, outputs, and outcomes in a general way. Um, and then at the next tier, we've talked about where on the logic model you might see input-related indicators, where on the logic model you might see output-related indicators, and where on the logic model you might see outcome-related indicators. So for inputs, you might look to the resources section of the logic model. For outputs, perhaps to the strategies and activities section. And for outcomes, you'd look to those outcomes, whether they're short-term, long-term, or impact. And, and so again, you're sort of you're mining your logic model for where to find indicators of success. Uh, and so let's take the example of the resources. You might look for the amount of resources used. For strategies and activities, if you're delivering workshops, you might look at the number of workshops delivered or the number of participants. And then for outcomes, you would look at the number and percent who learned the material or the overall improvement. And again, as you were all indicating earlier when we asked how you would know your programs and policies were successful, you were making suggestions of indicators kind of at all stages of the logic model, both in terms of um, ideas like how many workshops we delivered and also in terms of changes in participants' behavior or achievement, for example. So let's take this example of the um, College Ready program as an example. And in the workshop, what we do is we use the cases to illustrate kind of where you mine your logic model for indicators of success. Uh, and we're going to show both indicators that would be derived from the activities and indicators that might be associated with the outcomes on the logic model. So for the example of the activity-related indicator, if we have an activity in our logic model of delivering parent education classes, 
an indicator of success might be the number of classes delivered or the number of parents who attended. In both cases, these are process-related indicators. They're indicators that we're doing what we intended to do and not necessarily that we're having the desired outcome. And that's an important it, distinction. One kind of indicator is different from the other. And they're both important and they're both related to the logic model. And from the outcome section of the logic model, if parents understanding the college application process is a desired outcome, then an indicator of success related to that might be the number of parents who report increased understanding through, for example, a survey or a set of interviews. So again, you see here how you build from the logic model to indicators that you can track, both related to the process or the program that you're developing and related to the desired outcomes. Here is really a very good place to have participants stop and consider both those process and outcome indicators. And following this activity, we address the notion of qualitative and quantitative indicators. The main purpose of that section is to reiterate that one is not better than the other, but that the indicators should match what is designed to be measured. So you should match your indicators to what you're interested in. If time allows, the workbook also suggests an activity on page 47 that encourages participants to consider both quantitative and qualitative indicators for their own programs. That takes some time, but it can be very helpful to participants who are trying to develop a comprehensive design for evaluating their program. I know there are several questions coming in, um, and I see that Shayla answered Diane's. Um, so she says, I'm, I'm at barriers within the organization that challenges inputs, outputs, outcomes. Dan, if you could give us a little more guidance about what you're asking. I'm not sure I totally understand. So while I'm going to continue on a little bit with the workshop, but um, type in a little more information and we'll definitely try to respond to that question. Uh, Stephanie is asking if there will be separate toolkit webinar on measures. Um, which are appropriate under certain circumstances. So again, the toolkit itself provides some guidance about um, different types of measures and matching your uh, measures, whether they're qualitative or quantitative, to your desired, um, what it is you're interested in, in tracking. Um, it's a fairly broad brush. Again, the audience for this workshop is really meant to be not necessarily people who are experienced evaluators, but people who need to understand evaluation and work with evaluators. Um, but, if you, but there are other resources we have on our website, for example, that talk a little bit more about data use and practitioner data use, and some of that uh, information might be helpful to you as well. Um, and yes, and one of the things that is included in the webinar is some suggestions about, think, or in the toolkit and in the webinars that you can access, is some suggestion about thinking about measures beyond surveys. What are the range of measures that you can employ, and also um, what existing data can you use to, to guide your evaluation? Again, all of the real idea here is that all of this uh, work is derived from your logic model. So if you've built a good logic model, you can, f you can map from the logic model to a set of indicators to track. Um, I'll keep going, but I'll, I'll also address these questions as I keep going. Once we are done talking at some length about indicators, and again, you'll find more content in the toolkit about that, we move to uh, some guidance about how to build an evaluation design. And again, we encourage people to think about the purpose, audience, capacity, and priorities um, that are driving the need for an evaluation. And encourage people to think about both pre-existing and new data. And we have a data collection framework that helps folks um, to kind of think about what data they have at their fingertips and what data they might need. We then conclude. Um, with some guidance about how to develop a prospectus, an evaluation prospectus. Again, thinking about an audience of people who may not be evaluators themselves, but need to have a grasp of what kind of evaluation they want and communicating effectively with potential evaluators about what they're looking for. Uh, and we also provide some guidance on a Gantt chart, which is a targeted timeline with milestones indicated. And it's just kind of a template that can be useful in working through an evaluation project. That covers the basic content of session two. I want to pause here before I turn it over to Shayla and just see if I've addressed the questions. Um, John says you listed activity and outcome indicators on the last slide. Could we call the activity indicators outputs? Yes, actually, you will notice in the um, template that we've included, there is a section for outputs. And we didn't go into this 
again in detail in, in this workshop because our goal here is just to orient you to the tool in general. But yes, several people uh, or several logic models will have an output section that is really those indicators associated with the activities. They are not necessarily, um, so for example, an output could be the number of participants who attended a workshop. That doesn't mean the, uh, the participants got anything out of it or changed their behaviors, but they were delivered. And so that's a difference between an output and an outcome. Um, so I want to go back to Diana, and then I'll turn it back to Shayla. So Diana says, in terms of examples, one of the barriers to input is a well-defined data source. A barrier to output might be experienced trained staff. A challenge to outcome may be consistency in a protocol. So Diane, I think what you're getting at, and I think this, uh, just to sort of bring this back um, to the whole goal of logic models really about bringing together a group of stakeholders who have multiple perspectives and can contribute in different ways to building the logic model is to uncover some of those challenges. So if you do the logic model development right, you will talk about with the group who is building the logic model some of the challenges or barriers um, to implementation of whatever you've put in the logic model and uncover the assumptions. That's another thing we didn't talk about in this workshop, but we really encourage you to spend some time on is really working with the team who's building the logic model to think about what assumptions are driving um, the theory of change. So for example, if you have um, a college-ready program as the program that you want to build a logic model around, what does the team have as assumptions about the program that you're implementing? For example, an assumption might be that attending college is a, a viable goal for all, all participants in the program. So, there's some assumption about the value of college. Now, that may seem obvious, but having people step back and spend the time to talk about those assumptions can be very useful in terms of um, uncovering both the barriers and challenges and some potential ways to address those barriers and challenges as you're building the logic model. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shayla to talk a little bit about facilitation more broadly. Shayla. Thank you, Karen. Um, so, the, uh, so we want to talk a little bit about some effective facilitation strategies. And now that we have gone through both the sessions of the workshop, um, we just want to kind of provide you with some of these strategies that really worked for us um, as we were delivering these workshops in both a virtual and face-to-face -face format. So let's first talk about some strategies that you can utilize virtually. And we know that sometimes there are uh, limitations in what you can do in a virtual platform. Um, when we delivered the workshops virtually, we really tried to utilize the platform with the goal of engaging participants um, in as many ways as possible. And one function is by utilizing uh, the chat function to have discussions with the participants. Um, we also suggest using polls throughout the workshop, um, which is useful in generating some quick responses or ideas from the audience. Um, we have always used polls right at the beginning as well as a way to kind of get the pulse of the group just like we did at the beginning of this webinar. Um, it's also important to just stop for questions at designated times. Um, these sessions do contain a lot of information, uh, and it's always great to just pause and take any questions from the audience as we have been doing throughout this webinar. Now, if you're planning to deliver this workshop in a face-to-face -face environment, um, you can customize a lot of the activities based on how much time you actually have for each session. Um, if you only have a couple of hours for the session, then choosing a few activities may make the most sense. Um, but if you have half a day or more um, with your group, um, then really utilizing those light bulb um, suggestions on extending those activities um, is suggested. Um, we have provided those in the workbook. Um, so that way you will have enough um, you know, activities to really, get, uh, to really dig deep um, into um, having your participants really learn about the different elements of, of the logic model. Again, um, you know, just be very creative um, in engaging your participants during the activities um, and do provide opportunities for tabletop discussions, um, large group discussions um, where you think it's appropriate. Um, and having sort of a mix of hands-on activities and discussions will keep your participants engaged um, in the content of the workshop. So we want to give you some tips on how you can set up your participants uh, for success. We, we do encourage you um, encourage you know you to tell your participants to really attend in teams 
so that they are able to really think about their own context and start developing you know, a logic model for their agency, their organization, or their school or district. Um, we also uh, really encourage you to just uh, really use, uh, provide those pre-assignments um, to your participants before they attend the workshop, um, at, before attending session one and before attending session two, um, to sort, you know, to get them thinking really as, uh, about logic modeling. Now, if you know that your audience is addressing a certain issue or problem, then creating a case example that's related uh, to that issue or problem um, will definitely help them um, engage more in the content of the workshop. So, you know, have them bring ideas about projects or programs to really focus their time. You know, for example, like we delivered this workshop to a group of constituents that um, did a lot of work with English language learners, and so we just created a case example based on that. Um, so that made it more engaging and more relatable to them, and they were able to really understand the different elements um, of the logic model. So again, another is uh, another idea is just to really use the workbook. Um, you know, the workbook really lays out the steps that they need to take in order to develop their own logic model, um, and it will help them to really start thinking about you know evaluation and indicators of, of success and how the mo logic model can really help them. Um, think about that and, and take them through the step-by-step -step process. Um, so really use the workbook um, during the sessions. And then, um, so those are some just suggestions that you can use um, to really work with, with your participants and to help you in facilitating uh, these sessions. So now I just want to take a, a minute or so to just pause here for some questions, any last-minute questions that we, you may have regarding uh, facilitation. Um, any questions that you will, you know, you have for either Karen or I um, in regards to the workshop. Um, I just want to take a moment to just, you know, get any last minute questions um, before we uh, end uh, the webinar. Shayla, and as I said in the chat, I really appreciate um, the level of engagement in this webinar. That's exactly what we're looking for is and what you, we hope you'll look for if you're doing a webinar like this as a virtual one is to really figure out ways to engage people. I was really impressed with the level of engagement uh, among participants today and the great questions. So keep them coming. Uh, on the next slide, we have our email addresses. And so we really encourage people to be in touch with us as you implement the toolkit. Uh, you know, we put stuff out into the world, and we really want to know how it's being used. So. Don't be shy about being in touch with us by email and letting us know how you're using it or what challenges you might be encountering uh, using these tools in your own context. So, um, so again, just a reminder that the US Department of Ed really likes us to gather feedback. And it's really helpful for us to just understand, you know, was this helpful? What could we do better? Um, so please, it's very short. It's only going to take you two minutes um, if you can just log in and take the evaluation, the participant survey that we have here on the screen. Um, and just give us your feedback. And it's anonymous. And we, we really appreciate it. Again, Karen mentioned that um, you can contact us um, with any questions um, or if you need just any suggestions on, on helping you in facilitating this workshop. Um, we do want to thank you for attending this workshop. And we hope that you found it helpful. Um, so just don't hesitate to just contact us at all. Um, we're here, um, and we'll be able to sort of guide you or answer any questions you may have as you go through the toolkit. We know it's a, it's a pretty big document, um, so we just encourage you to just uh, let us know um, how everything is going. Again, thank you for joining us today. And in about two to three weeks, you're going to receive actually a thank you email from us with a link to the webinar archive. Um, we appreciate your completion of the feedback survey, and we want you to have a great afternoon. And again, um, just make sure you fill out that evaluation. Thank you again, and have a great afternoon.